Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramps, and I'm here to usher you into the weekend of November the 5th through the 7th, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, a little bit about that, and a whole bunch of other things happening, but I have a lot to talk about. It is First Friday. There's a huge... Uh, a brand new, a bunch of art exhibits happening in the downtown Missoula, Missoula area. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I got a lot of art clips. I also have even got a special uh, clip from our general manager, Joel Baird, uh, talking uh, about the open house that happened at the emergency winter shelter on Johnson and North Street. And you all get to see that in today's show. But we're going to kick things off with uh, John Deere. So John Deere is now in the process of getting union workers what they want. Will, uh, But, of course, they're still on strike until it's completely and utterly finalized. The uh, uh, Moline, I, uh, Illinois-based company, reported a $4.7 billion in net income for the first nine months of its fiscal year, more than double than $2 billion in the same year period. So thinking uh, uh, a rising tide raises all ships, the original deal uh, had immediate 5% raises for some workers and 6% for others, and 3% raises in 2023 and 2025. But the new one seems to lean more towards a wage increase of 10% in the first year and 5% in the third and fifth year under the tentative contract reached between farm equipment makers and the U uh, United Auto Workers Union. Your business does better. It only makes sense that the workers reap the rewards as well and not just the white collar workers and that the white collar worker jockeys running the blue collar warehouse type jobs to keep up with the demands. Uh, of course, that didn't end well, and so far, other workers of the industry like Kellogg and hospitals in New York are still going on strong. Kellogg, the multinational food manufacturer's 1,400 employees went on strike at the beginning of October, which kind of helped spark the uh, other strikes that happened, including the John Deere one. What led to many of these strikes was the uh, two-tier wage system. Hey, you got the people who are doing the labor, boxing the cereal, uh, manufacturing, actually uh, hands greased up and calluses on their hands. Uh, versus the people who are in the offices, uh, you know, putting on a commission, making money and like that and stuff. Um, such two-tier wage systems are often economically attract to both employers and unions. Employees see immediate reductions in the cost of hiring new workers. Think about it like this. Uh, if from the mind of a corporate boss, seniority makes sense that they should have benefits over new hires. But with an ever-growing gap, this has resulted in a revolving door of new employees and having less and less seasoned workers as a result, putting a strain on the workers, a.k.a. the blue collar, who, instead of training up someone, uh, ends up training someone just to get fired before they can prove themselves. Uh, Amazon basically follows these guidelines of the harder you work, the better chance you get to work your way up. Doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, they use... Uh, they use you up to three years and then fire you at the discretion and whatever rule they can come up with, and they do it all via phone and via text uh, that they give you, and they also use that to track you. So there's just so many stories that just about, about Amazon. They're a fairly new corporate uh, entity, and just a lot of that is kind of like preventing them from being able to do that. But before you start calling me a socialist, be aware that businesses need workers to provide the lifeblood, but without the business, the, li the blood is useless. We live in a, a throwaway culture. That is, if someone doesn't work, replace it. Uh, but without having a system in place that blood rejects the body and the business could die. Think about it like that. Fresh blood may sound like a great plan, but you're going to find yourself repeating the same rhetoric to the, sa to the point of warping what it means to be an employer over a group of people trying to make ends meet. The so-called PRO Act, which is still in reconciliation, the Build Back Better plan, and I spoke in length about this a lot. And this is one of the things that are just kind of being like, okay, let's see if we can get this through. This is still on the package and stuff like that. Everyone's just like, oh, we're giving tax breaks to millionaires, billionaires, blah, blah, blah. But regardless of that, uh, a lot of people, the biggest concern is the private contractors, uh, the smaller businesses worrying about, you know, the unionization and the PRO Act protecting them. But regardless, this is to protect people who want to form a union. There is not g there's not going to be a guarantee that people are going to want to form a union, but this is, the PRO Act is, and and it's uh, basically in its, assess in its essence to protect the workers to be able to form a union. But of guard this of private contractors, which are worried for a good reason, but small businesses don't have to worry of, of unions as much as the states that have the right to work states, like Montana. The right to work states, you know, non-union work, blah, blah, blah. You know, some people like that, private contractors, you know, Small businesses uh, tend to have uh, any need for unions because uh, you know, the, the even health care is barely covered within that because they can't afford it. There's reconciliation. There might be a lot of things progressives wanted, but the PRO Act 
by essential for workers' rights and protecting the middle class and maybe even grow it. Who knows? Uh, Missoula's election was on Tuesday, and the I this was the first election that included Montana's uh, new law, which uh, got rid of some same-day voter registration. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, voter restriction, a lot of things that you've been probably hearing nationally. HB 176, which is the House bill out of Montana, uh, restricted same-day registration, and it House Bill uh, 169 tightened restrictions to require ID upon uh, registration, requiring additional proof of address, you know, like you have to bring a bill in. Kind of like when you go to the library and just like, hey, I, here's my ID, like, here's your library card. And then you have to also provide a piece of mail and be like, oh, okay, so this is proof that you live in this address, bada bing, bada boom, you're good to go with a full-blown library card. So that's kind of how they uh, formed it in, that, in that, that deal. But this also makes it harder for college students to get registered and some folks from reservations to successfully register. Um, some cases of elderly retired folks have no need for driver's license and have no way to get the vote unless they were grandfathered in. Mail-in ballots were uh, on the... Uh, the only way that some people can vote, but applying has been done for those who are on top of the voter registration. So this is kind of like, uh, you know, it's like if you're forward thinking and you're, you're, uh, you're just like, oh, I need to get ready for this next election, you're, you should be fine, honestly. That's just, that's just kind of like the, the big takeaway from this. But it also looks like for Montana, the people who uh, uh, go around and ha getting people to register to vote is going to be working hard for the next few years and for the next election cycle, which is still kind of a big deal happening in Montana. And I'll talk a lot about this upcoming until once we get into the uh, 2022 election for our new House rep of Representatives, which we have two people who are going to represent the state of Montana rather than just the one person. All right, so let's talk about elections. So Virginia race kind of proved that the nation that as the pendulum swings one way, it inevitably has to swing the other way, uh, proving that one party can't get it done, so the other party has a chance to not get it done too. See a trend going on here? The GOP candidate of out of Virginia, Glenn uh, Youngkin, took the seat with an overwhelming presence, uh, presence in many districts that uh, saw more red districts. Um, but Virginia has been known to swing the opposite direction at the powers that be in the presidency. Uh, there's really not much to say but speculate. Uh, I already did that with the whole pendulum thing. Uh, Missoula's race ended uh, pretty predictably with John Engen getting over 60% of the vote for his fifth term. And the two new folks, Daniel Carlino and Kristen Jordan, are the newcomers. Carlino is the youngest member in his early 20s. Jordan has won more than 70% of the vote and will be the Ward 6 representative in place of Julie Merritt, who he chose not to run. Jennifer uh, Savage will replace Brian von Losberg as he did not seek re-election. Jordan Hess will continue in his Ward 2. Mike Nugent, uh, I believe he's the son of Jim Nugent, will take on Ward 4 in replace of Jesse Ramos, who uh, uh, who is n will not be continuing his uh, uh, his seat on Ward 4. Stacey Anderson retains Ward's 5 seat, and others, I already mentioned that, and of course, uh, many, many Missoulians voted on the tax to recreational marijuana, about three, uh, an additional 3% to be added to the state tax, which is 20%, and the 3% will be going towards Missoula count, about 50% uh, to the county, 45% to the city, and then 5% to, you know, dealing with, like, taxes and that kind of stuff that goes to the uh, Mon the Montana treasurer. So, of course, uh, uh, but they we did, but the city of Missoula did not vote on medical marijuana, and that was kind of uh, where the news ends. And there's kind of, like, a uh, couple things, just, there's always a bunch of things going on here and there, but other than that, Missoula kind of seems like they're staying the course, and a lot of uh, elections went pretty predictably as I've seen it. Um, and for the most part, uh, I do want to show you this next uh, clip that I did an interview with our uh, very own Free Cycles Executive Director, Bob Giordana. Uh, and he is talking about uh, exactly what Free Cycles is uh, doing uh, currently during the pandemic and also during the winter. So without further ado, here's this. Hey guys, we're here with Executive Director Bob Giordano, and he is the Executive Director of Free Cycles, and uh, we're going to touch base a little bit more about how you guys have been uh, uh, surviving the pandemic, and I've seen a lot of events kind of popping up through MissoulaEvents.net, and I was just like, I should get him on here. We haven't seen him in a while, and it's good to catch up. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about what uh, Free Cycles has been up to lately. Yeah, thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks, MCAD, and uh, I like the new digs here in the library. It's a suite. Um, we reopened for on-site work back in May, on May Day, May 1st, and we've just completed six months out, as of yesterday of all outdoor work all summer, and it was busy. People love biking still, uh, even more so after the pandemic. So thousands of people have come through the doors. We keep helping people with bikes, and then you mentioned events, and that's 
still a strong part of what we do, but we've had to tailor it back right. with uh, the COVID stuff. Yeah, and you guys have, uh, uh, I heard a couple years ago that you were working to buy the property. Um, uh, what is the status right now in terms of like ownership and all that stuff? Back in 2016, we were successful in purchasing the property. We raised 200 grand with your help, your help, my help, yep. everyone's help, the community. Um, that was enough for a down payment. We had a local benevolent investor uh, loan us a million dollars. Wow. And so we own the property now. We pay a mortgage, but we have some nice tenants, Zoo City Apparel, Yoga Studio, Soil Cycle, really wow. cool tenants that uh, all together, it, equals that mortgage, taxes, yeah. insurance. But we do have to refinance in a couple of years. So if you have- Which is good, yes. which is good a lot of times. Yes. Uh, yeah, because I refinanced recently and yeah. it was the best decision. Yeah. So if you have an extra million, we can outright own that property on First Street and do more programs, more biking, more sustainability, more equity, justice, and everything that makes Missoula special, we're, we're just happy to be a part of that. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about those uh, other organizations that are uh, that are working with you right now. Well, um, we occupy half the property. It's two acres, 28,000 square foot building with a lot of doors connecting everything. Um, Sacred Ally is one of the main tenants. They're a yoga studio, sound healing, uh, Tibetan bowls. It's really cool mm. healing, uh, very powerful. Zoo City Apparel, beloved local t-shirt shop, Soil Cycle, they take uh, people's food scraps and turn it into soil and then oh, give it back to folks. Nice composting. Yes. Nice. Um, and then we have a bunch of office tenants. Uh, Britt Arneson, she's a great local musician. She has, her, she has a recording studio. We rent a little space to Love Boat Paddle Company. Um, Inner Roads, they take youth into the wilderness and get them strong and uh, powerful and yeah. on the right track. Because so, there's always something about nature that really just kind of like gives you a sense of refreshment you know you know you're out there all the time but when you're inside you're kind of stuck inside the stuffy old house you know you can change your air filters all you want but you're not you're gonna get that sweet 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 air especially like the crisp bitter air that comes in Montana during the winter time I'm a winter guy by the way <laughs> yeah I love the winter too I love all the seasons here in Montana uh, getting people outside into nature and that's one of the reasons we do bike work is, yeah. you know you're not you're not in a car trapped behind the windshield uh, there's a, there's a place for that but most people in Missoula love to be outside and you know, biking is part of their life. Yeah. And so like uh, one of the things, you know, like wintertime, people are going to be more relegated to, you know, public transportation, less about biking. What are some of the things that you try to help encourage people to do more biking even in the wintertime? Well, one is we try to dispel the notion that maybe you have to go um, inside or in a car or a bus um, during the winter. Uh, the city's doing a pretty good job of maintaining bikeways, trails, and if you dress right, um, you know, people go skiing and sit on a chairlift with 40 mile an hour winds, 10 below zero, and they might say, well, it's a little cold to bike today when it's 20. Right. No, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, with the right bike and tuned up well and the right, right, right clothes, um, it's not that hard. Yeah. But we, we do all have to work together to make sure this community becomes more bikeable. And we have Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation, MIST. Oh. That's our advocacy, design, and research arm to help Missoula lessen our dependence on driving. We're not going to get rid of the car, but we certainly can drive less as a community, and there's a lot of health benefits to that. Nice. Sweet. So uh, tell uh, people a little bit more information about where people can get uh, more information about Free Cycles. Yes. Yeah. Uh, freecycles.org. Um, it's, it's an easy website to remember. Uh, we have our programs and hours on there. Um, that's really the main way. Uh, but we love for people just to stop by and see us over on South First Street West, three blocks west of Orange. We're open Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 6. We'll probably keep that throughout the winter because we want people to bike year round, not just when it's gloriously warm and sunny, all year round. So we're open year round. Nice. Well, thanks, Bob, for joining yeah. us. Yeah, we really appreciate it, Scott. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Can we shake hands these days? Uh, we just did. Oh. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about some movies that are coming out this weekend. Kicking things off with your pre-critic where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my uh, predisposition for movies. We're kicking things off with The Eternals. Yes, uh, yet another Marvel movie that's coming out this weekend. Uh, batten down the hatches, people, because it's time for your, daily, uh, the, your weekly dose of pizza. The <laughs> they were always there 
in the Marvel Universe. But hey, too bad they didn't cast him or didn't think about him at all during the, uh, you know, the whole, you know, end of the world of Avengers things. But hey, let's fit in 11 s new superheroes in a single movie about a franchise that has had them there for every human event in history. Probably the source of all human technology because we're too stupid to figure things out on our, se on our own. Watch this as they fight the latest CGI monsters geared towards sky beams that could only destroy the world. Endgame was pretty much that, the end game of the Marvel MCU. You have stars you might recognize like Angelina Jolie and some others, uh, comedians from other franchises too. Uh, Kamal D uh, Nanjiani is in there too, so I wanted to give him a shout out because he's really funny, but now he's going to get super jacked and be a Chris Pratt type. I don't know. Anyways, that's what's happening there. And then if you don't want to watch that, you can always watch this Oscar bait movie and uh, be all hoity-toity for your uh, media arts classes. Uh, yet another reason to hate the royal family, but this time it's portrayed by uh, pouty princess Bella Swan, Kristen Stewart in the role. That doesn't seem to fit her in the wheelhouse because Princess Dianus was a very happy person on the outside, but maybe they'll address more of her kind of like uh, poutiness during the inside of her family, kind of like, you know, how she privately suffered with her marriage with uh, uh, Prince Charles as he was... De uh, like, honestly, you can just watch The Crown. It's a good series. Just watch The Crown. It's, it's honestly... Anyways, the synopsis is about Diana's deciding to divorce Prince Charles. You can always watch The Crown instead, like I did. Moving on, uh, uh, this is a speed round. Let's let's kick things off. Uh, the beta test, or as I like to call it, stream video game hell. This movie is about a thriller about being blackmailed because he decided to have sex with a stranger. Who knows who it is? He doesn't know who she is, but uh, being billed as a dark comedy. Up next, we got Dangerous. Welcome to the world of Scott Eastwood films, doing his own thing, but still living in the shadow of his old man with no name. Clint Eastwood's the name. Dangerous probably has a man wanting to be left alone, left for dead, then revenge porn. Up next, we got sh oh, a, a Bollywood action flick. Hey, they've been doing better and better, and it isn't uh, Surya uh, Soryavanchi. Uh, if you watch the trailer, I watched the trailer, it's like, Soryavanchi. Uh, he walks away from explosions, does all the typical uh, stuff. His movie's trying too hard, but Bollywood's answer to Fast and Furious, Jason Board, One Word Versus 1000, this trailer is just action, action, action. Ida Red, uh, Uda Red, more uh, like Ida Dead than Ida Red, am I right? No? Okay. About a terminally ill mother looking to get her uh, son to pull, oh, to get her son to pull one last heist. Now, if only we can see her be a good mother. Up next, we got Violet. Uh, coming of coming of midlife crisis age where a woman who played it safe most of her life must become her true self. <laughs> Just living my truth. Uh, oh, and yeah, those are your free critic movies. <laughs> I was on a roll here and I totally forgot that was the last of the uh, movies. Uh, and so that's what's happening this weekend. Up next, we have a special clip from our uh, very own general manager, Joel Baird, as he talks uh, as he uh, goes to the uh, Pavarella Center, uh, the Johnson Street Emergency uh, Winter Shelter, and talks about, um, uh, and kind of shows what uh, some of the people are going to be living with this winter time until April. Emergency Winter Shelter Open House. Um, we're trying to just have a, an open dialogue with neighbors and community members and businesses in the area to show the, the project that we're working on and also to have an opportunity to talk with city staff, talk with Pavarello staff, talk with electeds. We have elected officials here as well and just really build some relationships to talk about what we're doing. Uh, so I was a city councilor that was meeting with city staff and stakeholders um, this last year, really. We started I think it was about mid-spring, uh, to try and figure out what the plan would be for this coming winter. So I was on the group uh, to try and figure out what our plan was going to be for sheltering people. And we were paying attention to the pandemic and realizing throughout the last six months that um, we were probably still going to be in this pandemic this coming winter. So we needed to figure something out. And if the Pavarello Center was again going to have to socially distance and be at 50% capacity, we needed a, an overflow situation. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where we could have that this year 
and ultimately came back to the Johnson Street shelters being the best option. So. I'm Jill Bonney. I'm the executive director of the Pavarello Center, and we're just really excited that we are opening the Johnson Street shelter on November 1st. So on Monday at 7 p.m., the doors will open and people will be able to come in and access services here, including um, just a warm place to, to stay. They can sleep. Um, we are serving one warm meal a day, but we'll also have suck lunches and snacks on site. Uh, we'll have staff here and can help people connect with services. Um, we're just glad that people are going to have a place to be um, because it's cold. It's cold outside. Yes, I think the homeless population has outgrown the Pavrello Center. And also we are dealing with some response to COVID. And so usually at this time of year, the Pavarello main shelter on 1110 West Broadway can sleep 175 individuals. But because of social distancing, we can only sleep 88, which cuts our capacity in more than half. So that's part of it. But then also, even without that, we're just seeing the numbers increase. Part of the reason is everybody knows the rental prices are going up in Missoula and we're seeing people priced out of rentals. And so um, we're still under, you know, an eviction moratorium. And once that expires, we're just not sure what's even gonna happen. We're just gonna continue to do the best we can to keep people from freezing on the street. Hey guys, we're back here. Uh, we're talking a little bit more about uh, city council and a little uh, diving deeper into some of the uh, issues that are happening over at the POV, but also some of the spillover uh, spaces as well. So we're going to kick things off. Uh, let's see here. Let me go look at my notes. The city is going to do a final reading uh, regarding how the city manager will handle the official uh, legalization of marijuana uh, in the city of Missoula, which includes Montana State Law House Bill 701 legalized in the cultivation, uh, processing, transport, retail, and possession of adult use marijuana and marijuana products. Local jurisdiction must be uh, uh, accepting adult use license applications from existing uh, medical providers and cultivators on January 1st, 2022, and on January, July 1st, 2023, local jurisdiction shall uh, begin accepting adult use license applications for new businesses. So if, you're, if you were planning on creating a whole brand new business, you're gonna have to wait until July 1st of 2023. So a whole year and a half before you, any kind of new businesses can start uh, popping up. But the current uh, infrastructure in place in the city of Missoula is about 60 plus dispensaries. So I think that we're not gonna lack in terms of the dispensaries. Uh, and, uh, of course, the city of Missoula voted uh, to move forward and a lot of adopting the plans about how the city and county are going to be uh, dealing with uh, this. But also, they're probably going to uh, talk about it in regarding the uh, the 3% tax that was approved just this last week. And they'll be implementing that, too, as well, starting uh, January 1st, 2022. Uh, one of the big things that are also happening, because uh, we were just talking, because uh, uh, General Manager Joel Baird showed a little video about uh, the Johnson Street uh, um a homeless shelter extension for emergency shelter uh, fencing near the Missoula camp composting okay so they're putting in fencing near the Missoula composting and wastewater treatment plant uh, designated camping site is on the consent agenda as well a couple things like sidewalks and claims playable to keep the lights on just here and there but Sandra Vasica talks a little bit more about these campsites and this is what she had to say I mentioned this last Wednesday but uh, at committee meetings but since uh, committee meetings are not as um, well audienced as city council meetings I just wanted to uh, briefly mention this again a lot of folks and businesses on Clark Fork Lane express concerns about the use of this property for an authorized camping site but because the city is or because the land is city owned it does not need to go through council to be used for an authorized camping site and so because we were unable to vote for the use of this land, I am in support of this fence to help with some of the concerns that the neighbors have. All right. And part of this uh, has also a lot to do with, uh, uh, you know, just uh, trying to uh, encourage people to leave the uh, uh, illegal camping sites. You know, there, there's the uh, the campsite that's across the uh, river on Reserve Street. You, you know, the composting places near the wastewater treatment plant. And I talked a little bit about this as well, especially during the summer. It can get really smelly with the wastewater treatment plant in that general area, and they're right next to the composting. So I don't know. It's it's kind of a, a it's it's kind of like exactly we're like okay, so we're putting it right next to where we throw away a lot of our leaf goods and stuff like that. I don't know. 
And so far, the site has authorized camping as a place to encourage the homeless population to camp in those areas rather than in the areas of concern, like Reserve Street. Uh, TDS Cable. Hey, that's a big name that we'll be, I'll be talking about as well because this affects Missoula, uh, actually MCAT mostly, uh, will be moving forward. City owns the physical cable line and is able to leverage money from the rate players and uh, cable companies looking to franchise in Missoula to, do I to be in direct competition with uh, Charter Spectrum. Te uh, Ted Nugent, uh, city, at uh, city attorney, talks about something that ha hasn't had that he hasn't had to talk about in more than 16 years. And this is what he had to say. The city has extensive ordinances about cable television franchises that we've had on the books for decades, but usually you don't see much action in this area because historically the cable TV franchises were for 15 years. Now, apparently with modern technology, uh, they seem to be going down to 10 years. The applicants usually want 10 years. We are in the process of uh, negotiating renewal with uh, Charter Spectrum. But last November, uh, TDS uh, contacted the city and wanted to know what it had to do to apply to have a cable TV franchise to compete with uh, Charter Spectrum. And of course, you know, that was just a little bit of background of uh, moving forward and exactly like what uh, the city of Missoula kind of like uh, is basically putting into as well uh this is a real item th this uh the real item these co oh, the real item this company is after is high-speed internet but are willing to provide phone internet and tv competing with spectrum on all those fronts jim also mentions how they plan to uh it be in investing their money into the city of Missouri. they're going to invest approximately 46 million dollars in a cable tv franchise and it will take 24 to 48 months, most likely, for the build out. That's within the city limits. Of course, they'll probably eventually be moving along outside the city limits as well. So the plan is ne not necessarily to be like in the next four or five years. They're, they they want to move forward on you know, like uh, putting more infrastructure in there, fiber and all that fiber optics, and continuing the services, but also expanding upon the service and. Uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, direct competition with the two is only going to benefit the city of Missoula. And, you know, a lot of times, hey, I don't I, I hate to uh, give props to Spectrum, but, um, uh, you know, they've been very good stewards to uh, provide us our uh, provide us a channel here on MCAT as well. But TDS is a whole nother uh, uh, deal and they're going to be franchising through the city of Missoula. So in a lot of ways, it's going to be like a whole nother uh, kind of system in place that we're going to be able to put on the TDS cable channel as well moving forward. I don't want to talk too much about it because this is all kind of like in, in motion and moving forward and stuff like that. And so they're working on the memorandum, a memorandum of understanding and talk a little bit more about that. But lots of money investment from the TDS cable company and just goes to, sh uh, goes to show you that the ever-growing Missoula is just creating this competition. Their reps met with the city and our station to discuss the details on how we work and how they will fit into our city. Uh, and then, of course, they talked a little bit about the Linda Vista, Linda, Vista, Linda Vista annexation is on the slate for final consideration. And Stace Sanders speak, speaks on future development and concerns that some of the people in the community have. I've heard from several constituents who are very concerned about the fact that we're continuing to grow and really feeling that there is a pinch point um, getting in and out of the Linda Vista Miller Creek neighborhood. All right. So, uh, of course, as you heard, the like, you know, pitch point getting out of the Linda Vista neighborhood as well. She, uh, Stacey Anderson, you know, as Missoula grows, you know, one of the biggest concerns is infrastructure, you know, the high uh, use of traffic, not to mention, you know, you got to understand that, you know, there's two seasons, winter and construction. And so there's always reconstruction, maintenance of roads and stuff like that. So there's always going to be uh, the more people drive on the roads, the, la the roads have a uh, higher wear and tear. And then the Linda Vistaria. Hey, not not to mention that like, they have that new school that they built up there, uh, the Jeanette Rankin School, which will, which is basically going to be the new influx of all the kids from the former Cold Spring schools. And so far, they voted to approve that, but the city wanted to make sure that they think about traffic concerns moving forward. And I could talk about the Mullen area as well, since that the 40, 54 acres of land near the area, they're going to be alleviating a lot of the traffic. You know, there's like Full Lane, England Boulevard. Those are the big uh, high traffic areas for a lot of people in that Mullen area looking to uh, kind of cut their uh, commute from the down from downtown or up uptown to the airport, kind of they like their commute a little bit shorter. But so far, uh, and of course, uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. 
And finally, in 2020, long-range transportation, uh, transportation plan for how we move forward with public roads and transit. Uh, and of course, it's required every four years. And I'm going to talk a, uh, so a lot in length about the mountain line, and they're giving an update on, uh, about how they uh, won a 2021 um, a national award for transit and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we move on into public works so public works give an update on the mountain line bus system and since we're speaking of the transportation we want to check in with our system that is free and is a fare free system in the si for all missoulians and it's been that way since 2015 when the city of missoula voted to make it fare free corey aldridge general manager of mountain line uh, kind of give this uh, introduction, kind of gave a brief overview about exactly what he's going to be talking about in this presentation, and this is what he had to say. Uh, so we want to talk about one of our, our biggest projects that we've done is our bus stop improvement project uh, that is underway, and talk about upcoming expansions and then our pressing needs on that. Probably the biggest thing to start off with is, you know, thanks to uh, the community and the support that we received from Azula. Mountain Line was selected as the 2021 Transit System of the Year for North America. So uh, it's a really uh, big accomplishment, and this just uh, acknowledges all the work that's been done uh, to move public transportation forward in Missoula. Okay. So, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I got to get my... Uh, he had, he had a lot of pauses, so I I don't know I didn't know when to switch back. But anyways, um, so far the mountain line has continued with COVID nineteen uh, vaccine locations, and uh, that that was one of the big uh, pushes is that being able be, like that's one of the things that actually got them the award was being able to transport folks to get their vaccines and transportation from U.S. Uh, transportation director and actually got a shout out from uh, U.S. transportation director Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg Sorry, it's either uh, it's easier said than read. But uh, Montana Line received three point five million dollar grant, which will be going towards the four, four brand new electric buses, making Missoula's transit fifty seven percent electric and sustainable. And before you know, like you know, you you want to see. Of course, you can say like, oh, all electricity comes from like coal and natural gas and all that stuff. Hey, listen, it's a step forward, and a step forward is a step forward. Shanti Johnson, communication for Mountain Line, talks about some of the accomplishments accomplishments uh, moving forward, and this is what she had to say. Every year, we we set aside some funding for events, for you know, showing up to community events and doing things like that. And in 2020, we had nowhere to invest those funds. And so we thought the best way to invest those back into our community would be a public art installation. So we partnered with the City of Missoula Public Art Committee, and we were able to put out a public art call, which eventually was... Um, answered by a young indigenous artist, Stella Nall, and she tackled this really tricky location on the outside of our transfer center downtown, which has some pillars and beams, and she completed that installation this summer. Cool. So, so of course, you know, in an art clip, we kind of showed a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the art that was being featured at the Transit Center. You can go there anytime. You can see that a lot of the art. It's really fun. Uh, other than that, very little incidents. They talked to, uh, talked about, you know, they did over a million miles covered in 2021, and the main focus Shanti wanted to focus on was the presentation is about safety of bus stops, especially those near intersection. And so this is what she had to say about that. We're looking at the routes one and two as phase one. So those are our highest ridership routes. Um, they're also you know, served by other routes like the routes 12 and six and seven. So there's some crossover, but it's our most dense population of riders. And so we have enough funding to really upgrade the infrastructure at those stops. So we'll be adding what you may have already seen, new bus stop shelters, um, new seating infrastructure, like you can see here in the picture, these are little semi seats that offer more comfort for riders while they're waiting. We're also adding 68 more accessible boarding and alighting areas, and this is meeting that goal of accessibility. So all of Mountain Lion's vehicles are 100% ADA accessible, but not all of our stops are. So there are people who could, you know, successfully navigate the bus with their mobility device, but maybe can't access it from wherever they need to get on. So these are these large concrete pads that you're seeing going in around Missoula that makes them more accessible. Okay, so uh, you know, like accessibility is a big uh, portion of this, and you know, like you know, you always have those curbs that you know, it's like, okay, it dips down. It makes it easier for people who are you know who can't necessarily step up and who who don't work really well with stairs just in general. And being able to uh, have your wheelchair go up and over that is makes it a lot easier for a lot of people. But at the same time, with the bus stops, 
you know, you'd think that, oh, okay, so it's right next to the corner, but then, you know, of course, they make those uh, concrete slabs right there. It may be like, oh, what are these for? They're definitely supposed to help with uh, ADA accessibility, make it easier for people to get on the bus and have a better pathway to it. Um, let's see. Let me look at my notes. Where was I in my clips? Another big thing is that more trash cans are putting in, in place in these high traffic areas. There is not much room, if any, on buses for garbage. And so Shanti uh, Johnson, she also talks about, okay, so this is a, a big thing that's happening, is that they're going to be removing a hundred stops within the city of Missoula. And, uh, and this is what she has to say in, in reference to that. To meet the goal of efficiency, we're actually reducing our total number of stops by about 100. And this sounds really dramatic, but if you start to look at our whole comprehensive system, like I said, we, we added bus stops, but we haven't really looked back and taken out bus stops that either don't need to be there or they're redundant. So um, I think looking at the university corridor is a great example where you have a bus stop, a block, a bus stop, a block, a bus stop. Well, that... Um, takes away from how quickly we can serve riders by stopping every other block. So by removing that middle stop, we're becoming more efficient, but people still have access within about a five minute walk of another stop. Okay, so of course, you know, uh, many of you might, be ha might have to walk a little bit further just to get to your bus stops, but they uh, usually assess this by improving uh, some stops and getting rid of some uh, stops per block, because in a lot of ways, the university system is one of the main focus of the areas where they use an example for. And uh, one of the things is that, hey, you don't need to stop every, you know, every block or so. So they're trying to like mitigate it and be like, hey, we have just a central location for people to have a stop. You may have to walk another block or two, but other than that, they just want to make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you're not stopping the bus every other stop, every stop, and then you know, slowing down the process and everything like that. And so, and and just just like the general numbers, and of course, they they do regular counts of how many people actually use the ridership of the buses. And uh, yeah, improving some stops and getting all that stuff. So uh, in terms of, of increase, and, and also they're looking to increase uh, the amount of stops. And also they're going to start including Sundays for public transit. And uh, Corey Aldridge, the executive dir director of Mountain Line, talks uh, much more about uh, their uh, dramatic plans moving forward to have transportation 24-7. Um, Mountain Line has never been, has never run service on a Sunday before. And with this uh, plan, it would bring Sunday service in and we would have seven day service for the very first time. So as we went out to the voters, uh, the voters overwhelmingly passed uh, this measure in support of, of providing more public transportation to the community. And you see here, this shows a map of, of what we are currently have on the left our current service levels and with our expanded service uh, we're going to increase service by roughly 28 percent Oof, 28 percent it's a that's a it's a big it's a big move that the uh the transit center is growing and i uh, think like heck a lot of other communities and other other cities are looking towards uh, missoula as an example like how can we improve our bus system and have such great success and like it's it's kind of crazy just how like it kind of went from day and night like we're like th making some major uh decisions and uh having people and infrastructure and just having people do a lot of these uh things in the last like god like seven eight years just uh really just kind of seeing how the transit system has overtly changed and having a uh, route one and route two having those what they call the bolt system where like oh a bus is guaranteed every 10 15 minutes for people trying to get around town and especially in those high traffic areas and uh, there's you know there's a lot of stops but uh saturday we'll see a lot a uh, lot longer hours and uh, weekdays too with an added sunday service vote uh, voters in 2015 wanted the fare free service 2018 saw the expansion of those services uh, I remember when kids only rode free in the summer and they had to be under 18. The big ask for, so far is money for a new facility and for new drivers. So uh, Corey talks a little bit more about uh, one of their more pressing needs because with every presentation, it always ends with being like, hey, everything seems great and all, but if we're going to grow, this is what we're going to need. Uh, we have running a slightly reduced service because of the lack of operators. We, uh, the operators we do have are awesome. They're great. Uh, but uh, we've been working them hard, uh, and uh, we we see that that's uh, not sustainable for a long period of time. All right. So uh, one of the other bigger things as well is that they want to have a brand new facility. 
And so the facility that they have currently right now is kind of like gridlocked and kind of locked between, you know, a couple neighborhoods and also the uh, railroad tracks. So they can't really expand. They've been doing some remodeling to maybe adjust some walls to make it a little bit bigger. But so far, their location near the railroad is just not going to cut it because their need is for about a 10-acre parcel to grow sustainably. And so um, I kind of thought about this a little bit more, and I, th I was thinking kind of like it's like, you know, they're – they they were thinking about moving as far as the airport, but a lot of times they wouldn't be able to hire more um, uh, drivers because of the gas mileage and all the energy that would be used to go from the airport to the transit center. So I was actually thinking that maybe the area around the transit center, you know, where they have, uh, you know, City Hall, the uh, police station, because I know that the city is also looking to uh, move into the federal building, the old post office historic landmark that is the downtown um, kind of off-Broadway location. And so that's a good idea to just kind of think about, um, you know, if the city is going to move um, into those buildings, they're also planning on taking a lot of other, like the county and also uh, the, the police department. Heck, it would be a lot easier, maybe even like uh, kind of beneficial to everybody if the transit center actually moved towards the, um, uh, the, the offices of the buses would be moved to the transit center. There's a lot of, that's a lot of property right there. I don't know if this can sustain the amount of, uh, of Tra trucks, or I mean the amount of buses that they're going to have there, but that's just a thought kind of coming out of my head just in terms of potential, uh, hey, it would be a good location for to continue on more uh, Missoula, and that would be very centrally located in the downtown Missoula area for people to have transit. But overall, Zero Fair has been proven to the nation as a whole that this uh, has other cities talking about Missoula as a forward-moving transportation infrastructure that benefits all Missoulians and those who visit Missoula. Uh, other than that, it's pr pretty much a light week in the city of Missoula that there's only one committee meeting. And, uh, um, and then, as always, it was a short uh, city council meeting, barely reaching an hour. So up next, we have a new art clip featuring Jody Leitner, who is being featured in the atrium and kind of like just the overall entryway at the Missoula Art Museum. And then after that, I'm going to show you guys uh, some more art and talk about First Friday because it is the first Friday of the month. guys welcome back it's time for your art installation clip it is time for your first friday art guide starting at 5 p.m in the downtown missoula and other surrounding areas is that art is being featured in the city of missoula it is first friday and we're kicking things off with emergence so we're emerging out of the fall weather moving into more of winter weather and we're kicking things off with uh Tectonic Emergence, featuring works by the graduate students of the University of Montana. A lot of people, as students of the university, the artists of the exhibit will share works that reflect the commitment of the university's ceramic department towards the individual exper expression. And experimentation include in the show will be a diverse representation of contemporary ceramics, including unitailer, uh, uh, a lot of uh, conceptual pottery, ceramic sculpture, and mixed media works and stuff like that. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of highfalutin words in this. But regardless of that, there's a lot of great art coming from the University of Montana, great students. Uh, Moments of Time Painting, Gallery 709, Inside the Montana Art and Framing. Uh, it will be featuring Moments in Time, Capturing Montana Scenes, Watercolors by uh, Nancy Finch, and Oil Paintings by Reca Rebecca Fisk. And Tom Zavitz, uh, this is going to be happening from uh, the month of November, opening f uh, first Friday, and it's going to be opening from 5 to 9 p.m. 
for more information, go to uh, MontanaArt.com. And then what we have next is we got uh, the 8th Annual Holiday Show at the Radius Gallery. This year, more than 150 artists will uh, uh, contribute a massive array of eye-popping affordable artworks at Radius Gallery for the 8th Annual Holiday Show, making it a wonderful opportunity for collectors and gift givers alike. New works will be introduced throughout the run of the show. Then we have Missouri Art Museum. As always, the Missouri Art Museum will be open for extended hours during the first Friday. Uh, this will be uh, here as well. You get to see new fall and winter shows with a chance to meet exhibit artists Andre Joyce Heimer and Jody Leitner, like I just showed you in the video. And MAM will be open until 7 p.m. that night. Then we have Oils by Annie Eastwood. So this is Montana Speaks Plainly, providing professional uh, uh, printing services for artists and photographers for over 10 years locally in Montana, Western Montana, born and raised in Montana. Uh, creator of some of the first large oils and was represented by her first gallery at 19. Uh, Anne Eastwood, a passion for creating paintings of the outdoor places and have worked and traveled in order to share the scenery of wilderness with everybody. Finally, we got the When We Could Fly. Sarah Conti is a ceramic sculpture from the Western Montana. She re received a BFA uh, with a sculpture emphasis in the University of Idaho. After undergraduate, she lived in Illinois for three years and was a resident as the Terra I Incognito Ceramic Studio. And so this one will be featured at, oh, wow. Let me just double check some things as well. I am totally lost on this. Just bear with me. Um, no. Darn, I hate misspelling things. Because I always do. And this w this event that's happening as well, uh, I'm so sorry. I did not see exactly uh, when we could fly is going to be featured at, uh, hey, pop-ups. <laughs> so when we could fly, and that's going to be featured at, oh, Wildfire Ceramic Studio. So sorry about that. So Wildfire Ceramic Studio is at 2502 Murphy Street, Unit A in Missoula, Montana. And uh, and this is going to be featuring when we could fly. All right, so those are about your art clips for uh, today. Um, I have another art clip featuring uh, Neil Ambrose, which will be featuring at the. Uh, let's see here. I gotta cue this up right. And then here is uh, Neil Ambrose Smith is going to be featuring. Uh, Where are you going? And he is currently at the Missouri Museum. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about events. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Those are pretty much all the videos I have for you guys, and we're going to kind of go a brief overview of what's happening for your events as well. Hey, if you're interested in an uh, introduction to pickleball, it's happening right now at the Lifelong Learning Center. They have regular classes that teach all sorts of things, Microsoft Excel, 
so you can stop lying on your resume about pre being proficient on Excel. Uh, li uh, library events on the second floor, starting with uh, Tiny Tales and Storytime at 10.30 a.m. Spectrum is going to be doing an event from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. They do it pretty much, uh, I believe, from Tuesday through Saturday. Great, uh, art uh, great exhibit, STEM, uh, science, hands-on learning, and fun stuff like that as well. Uh, uh, community Connections, Family First Learning Lab has activities in place as well and abil ability for parents to uh, uh, consult with other experts on uh, proper ways of parenting and stuff like that. But anyways, just uh, give them support and, um, and engagement with their and uh, give them different tools into their arsenal and figuring out how to wa ways to uh, handle some of their kids depending upon if they need it or not or just general support. Yarns and watercolor on the fourth floor of the library starting at around noon today. Uh, and those are some of the events that are happening here at the library. Uh, if you're interested in uh, basically getting rid of your pumpkins, they have pumpkin reharvest, which is happening until uh, tomorrow uh, and from about 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then various locations uh, around Missoula. Uh, there is anything for your uh, knowing that you have 8 million Halloween pumpkins is going to the landfill each year. Let's not uh, sentence these guys to such fates. Let's take them to uh, composting. And so you can go to various locations around town. You can look that up. Uh, and this is being sponsored by Soil Cycle. Uh, landscape Geology Driving Tour. Montana Natural History Center is hosting a discussion at Glacier Lake, Missoula, uh, Faulting River, Bend Dynamics, Erosion, and more. You will see the world around you in the drama of ancient and ongoing geological events. Drive our forgotten river tra uh, tra uh, traverses, um, tr uh, sorry. see uh, evidence of faulting and investigate the history of our local topography. All right. Virtual Women's Justice Benefit Luncheon. They do it every week at the through the YWCA. You can find a link at the YWCA's website, ywcamissoula.org. Base camp programs. Uh, this is a fun activities for First Friday Day Camp. If you want to drop your kids off at the old library right next door to us, it's base camp is a great way for kids to go to this. Uh, your first base camp is free. It's five dollars per session. And after that, it's not that's that's it's nothing to uh, uh, sc uh, scoff about. And so it's a it's a great activity uh, base type stuff. If your kid, if you don't want to expose your kids to art. Uh, you can always expose your kids to a base camp and a fun activity to meet with other kids and have some fun along the way. And like I already said, First Friday is happening from about 5 to 8 p.m. I already talked about them. And if you're interested in doing part of the Big Sky Film Series Presents Torn, it's going to be featured at the Wilma starting at 6 p.m. Wiley Hale is the greatest mountaineer of his generation. Alex Lowe was a towering figure in the world of outdoor sports, but he loomed even larger for his oldest son, Max, who was only 11 in 1999 when Alex was buried by an avalanche along with cameraman David Bridges while attempting to ski the north face of mountain uh, of Mount uh, Shishapanagama um, in, in the Tibetan Himalayas. 17 years after their death, a, a continuation of Lowe's and Bridges' bodies were found by two climbers attempting the same route in the following months. This is a documentary uh, intent kind of a uh, coming of age and being able to reconcile with a uh, father who uh, died tragically. If you stick around long enough, uh, band Pump and Dump will be playing later that night at the Wilma as well, starting at 7 p.m. So Josh Farmer, I want to give a shout out to him. He's do one of my favorite local jam bands in Missoula. He's going to be playing at Union Club, Union Hall, uh, Union Club uh, uh, tonight. All right, Saturday, uh, it's the end of the farmer's market, and tis the season for craft fair, people. Big Sky kicking off the craft fair at 9 a.m. starting on Saturday. It's a, it's a great way for people to kind of have holiday gift baskets and figure out uh, just kind of fun, cheap ways to uh, find out your Christmas gift giving and stuff like that. Hey, online shopping is going to be a real uh, slowdown this, this winter as well. There's uh, just basic transportation of goods and services are a lot slower your amazon packages are coming in slower all that stuff so you may want to start thinking shopping locally uh if you're going to have to shop last minute but then again if you're looking to shop now is the time to do it and as always mcat does our studio tour and training at 10 a.m if you want to do a show like i'm doing right here you guys can t stop on by it's a drop-in it starts at 10 a.m and it goes for about an hour not too long but the nice thing about it is you're able to rent out equipment, uh, cameras, audio uh, recording gear, but most of all, you get a, a touch base with us and talk a little bit more about your video media dream. If you just want to do an online blog, cool, but we just want to uh, help uh, you along the way with your media dream. All right, moving on. Uh, Pumpkin Reharvest, like I said, the, the locations are 736 Southwest, Southgate Mall, 
Rockin' Rudy's, and Karis Nursery will be all taking all your pumpkins for composting. So I did not see that in my first uh, pitch for the pumpkin harvest, but this is going on from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. today and tomorrow, and then that is your chance to get rid of all your pumpkins. Teen Open Studio at the MAM. I want to give some shout-outs to the Missouri Museum. They do this every week, um, and they do it at 12 noon every single Saturday, and this is to encourage uh, teenagers with art. They also provide free supplies for the kids as well. Uh, Saturday drop-ins here at MCAT. Uh, kids can do some stop animation, make some movies, and it's a nice way to get introduced into media and work with other kids along the way. Um, there's also a Saturday Kids Activity at the Montana Natural History Center. This is uh, Track Detectives. Drop in any time between 1 and 3 for hands-on kids' activity. Uh, join us to learn more about animal tracks. They will put detective hats and will look in the tracks and learn how to identify them. All right, so Trap Release Workshop presented by Footloose Montana. Nine Mile Community Center is hosting a uh, workshop to how to release uh, your dog or your pet from a uh, basically a trap, uh, one of those... Uh, yeah, one of those wolf or bear traps or anything like that. There's al there's also a lot of different other traps as well, but this is an ability to release it. And it's at 2 p.m. at Nine Mile Community Center, and it is a great way to uh, uh, learn how to avoid traps and how to open traps, first aid, uh, trapping regulations, what to carry with you when you rescue your companion animal. Uh, and then also Saturday night, they're ha doing a, a rock show at the Walma. Highly Suspect will be playing. Live music with Wolf and the Moons will be at Cranky House Public House. Missoula Symphony Orchestra is going to be at the Denison Theater on Saturday night, so it's a great way for you guys to get involved with that. Salt Snare Karaoke at, at uh, the West Side Lanes, so we get to see some karaoke sar uh, Saturday nights. And then I wanted to mention that there is a November Family Workshop at the Clayson View of Missoula kicking things off. It's $20 per student, minimum of two students per party. And uh, it's starting at 2 p.m. at the Clay Studio of Missoula. Create something special with the Clay Studio of Missoula. They do these kind of events uh, very sparsely, but this is a very geared towards helping people with their uh, studies. But a lot of times it's an open studio for anybody who want to make ceramics. And always look for classes, and you can look at th them up as long uh, online if you Google them at the Clay Studio of Missoula. So that about does it for me and my morning show. I had a full show for you guys and a lot of things I talked about. But without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining me. I hope you have, have a wonderful weekend. October is behind us. It's time to look forward for November. It's going to get cold out there. Uh, hunker up and buckle down. Uh, it's time to uh, really think about the colder weather that's going to be coming in uh, this winter time, which is pretty long in Missoula. So thank you, and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramsey.